Firstly, as usual, we start off with a question. What is atmosphere? What do we think atmosphere is? Who can give me an answer? Ada? Uh, a sensation. A sensation? Great. What else? Who else has an idea what atmosphere is? A feeling of space. Feeling of space, perfect. Up the back? Hey, someone's looked at the lecture slides before class. Well done. You got it. So, Zumpho breaks it down into one key line. I think this is really critical to remember when we're asking ourselves that question, particularly in design, because we're designing atmospheres this semester, is we're trying to make a space that moves us. And so that's a really critical way to think about space in that we're not just making a building here. We're making something that when we enter, or as we arrive, or even as we leave, it leaves an impression upon us, something that lasts a long time and really makes us think about it. We know what that feeling's like when we leave a movie that was really, really impactful, or we leave a conversation with a person that was really, really interesting. There was an impression that was left upon us. And so that's what we're trying to achieve when we're looking for atmosphere in architecture, something that really moves us and leaves an impression with us, something that stays around. And in his book, Atmospheres, which you're all reading for design as well, but we're going to break it down today, he talks about nine different principles of atmosphere and what they mean in terms of trying to create architecture. Now, this isn't a hard and fast rule and that if you tick all of these boxes, you have an architecture that is moving and atmospheric. And nor is it saying that you'll definitely have good architecture if you follow these principles. What it is saying is that these are the way he has found to create atmosphere in his own work in the past and that we can learn something from that, which I agree. Okay, so the first of the nine principles is what he calls the body of architecture. And he says that architecture is a bodily mass. It is a being that has a form, it has insides. It is a vessel for holding things inside. It can be viewed, touched, listened to, smelled. It is real. It is a physical thing. So architecture, unlike other mediums, maybe if we're talking about digital art or film or other things, architecture, first and foremost, is a physical thing. It's something that we can interact with. It has a tactility to it. But also to the sense of a physical thing, it has a weight. Some architecture is very, very light and airy. Some architecture is very, very heavy and dense and poetic and somber, and it makes us think. If we go to a memorial, and this just happens to be in my mind at the moment because we've been talking about the September 11 memorial a lot at the moment, there is a type of experience that we're looking for within the architecture, and it has a feeling to it. Whereas if you go, maybe let's say, to a gallery which is releasing some of the latest artwork, that is going to have another feeling as well. Both experiences might leave something with you, might mark you forever. So they have an atmosphere, but they have a different weight to them. So we think about the body of the architecture. What's the mass? Number two is material compatibility, and that materials react with one another. Each composition gives rise to something unique. There are a thousand different possibilities in one material alone. Materials have weight and a presence, and when combining them, you need to consider the ultimate balance. So what this says is that we, as the designers, not only are we creating a form and shaping a form, we need to think about what we're using as the material to do that shaping. And we might be cladding material against an existing substrate. We're using some sort of skeletal system and we're applying a skin to that. Or we might be carving away from a solid material and the material that is the structure is also the face material that we see. So we need to think about what is the material that we're going to touch, see, and experience. We also need to think about how that material is composed overall. So like we're making an artwork and we might have a lot of white space and then a blue circle slightly offset from the symmetrical center and a red line going down the middle of it. And that might be an abstract impressionist artwork from after the modernist period. But the reason it's successful is because it is composed, highly composed. It has balance to it, which gives it integrity. We look for the same thing in architecture. So what we might think of instead of 
circles and lines off balance from one another, we might think about what if we have a room which is entirely made of the same material but in different ways. So we use black butt flooring. Then we have it on the walls, but the walls are sinewy and they play with the veins of the timber. And then the roof is doing something, again, it's all buffeted and playing with different acoustic panels, but it's all black butt. So the entire room feels like this one cocoon that we can enter inside of and be a part of that experience. That's one composition. Another composition is to think about how different materials might balance together. So we might have a big bare concrete room, something brutalist, something impressive like the Japanese would do, maybe Tato Ando. But inside that room, when we've been meandering through this concrete maze, we get this beautiful brass handrail that's just ever so slightly against the wall, taking us down the steps. And the balance between the heavy weightiness of the concrete against that shining slither of brass is really quite beautiful and engaging. So that's another element to composition as well. So you need to think about what are your materials that you're using? Is it something that's just been applied to something else, like a skeletal system? Or is it some sort of solid material that we're carving away from, and both the structure and the face material are the same thing? And then what's the composition overall? Number three, the sound of space. Interiors are like large instruments, collecting sound and amplifying it. The shape of the room and the surfaces of the materials inside will alter the sounds. Some rooms we want to be silent, others we want to be loud. The same sound played in different spaces will sound different, and that means buildings have their own harmony and tone. So this is another interesting thing to think about. So when you're identifying that experience for your user for design, and you're trying to think, well, what is the progression and the sequence of their experience? You can think about the sound. So what do they hear when they're outside the space? And then what materials, what shapes do I need in order to enable that? And then when they're entering the threshold of the space, do I want to compress them down? Do I want them to feel like they're an individual? And so maybe I need to make the surfaces quite soft so I no longer can hear anything from the outside and I start to feel alone. And then when I progress through to the next space, it opens up and it's cavernous and I can hear the birds from outside and the cars going past and people moving. And so the sounds change as our experience changes. So you need to think about that as well. Not only are the materials impacting the composition and the aesthetics, they're impacting the way in which we experience the space in terms of sound. <coughs> that final quote there from Zumthor, saying that the same sound played in different spaces will sound different, is a really interesting one as well. So you could walk around with a recording on an iPhone, say, for example, and you could play that in 10 different spaces by 10 different architects, and that sound would sound slightly different in each space that you play it. And what that means is the space itself is impacting the way in which we interpret sound and acoustics. So they have their own resonance, they have their own feeling, their own vi vibration, and we can tailor that based on the types of materials that we use. Next one, the temperature of space. Every building, much like a sound, has a temperature. This is more than just the conductive properties of materials. Yes, we understand that steel pulls the warmth away from us faster, therefore, feels colder than timber, which pulls heat away from us slower. But there's also temperature to colours, the experience, the way light enters, how views can permeate and more. So temperature is so much more than a physical presence of temperature of heat or cool. So you need to think about what is the temperature or feeling of the space that you're trying to identify for your design. So if you want to have people, you're imagining a lot of the time people are going to come to this space during uh, summertime, lunchtime. I'm making a meditation space for busy workers and they need to be able to unyoke, disconnect from their phones and do whatever they're doing. And part of that experience is I want them to be able to cool down. It's so hot outside, uh, the sun's beating down on them, so I want to use materials that feel like they're pulling that warmth away from them and allowing them to calm their system down and just slow everything down. So I'll use cooler colours, I'll use cooler feeling materials like concrete and steel. I'll use materials that the sound doesn't travel too far, so it's not feeling super energetic, it feels calm. And that is the temperature of the, this space. Surrounding objects. Whether you're a minimalist or a hoarder, the objects you surround yourself with contribute to the atmosphere of the space. 
the relationships between these objects create a dialogue, a story. It is very clear when objects have come together in a caring and loving way, architecture becomes a receptacle for nostalgia. So there's a lot to unpack there with what Zumthor is talking about. But effectively, it is this. Architecture is a vessel for holding things. Unlike other forms of art, it must also function. It must allow objects and people to traverse through, to stay in, and to be a part of. Now, we can design all of the materials. We can design all of the transitions, the forms, every part of it. But there are also going to be objects that play a role inside that space. So the furniture of the space, the objects that other people might bring into the space, the clients and end users, these are all going to have a role. So you need to think about what sort of objects you might want to have as part of that spatial experience. Now, what he says here is the relationships between these objects create a dialogue, a story. What that means is that two objects placed together in a room are going to have some sort of contrasting dialogue conversation between one another. So what you decide to place in a room, particularly if you're doing something like a museum space or a gallery, which is relatively sparse except for a few objects, the objects that you put in there collectively are going to say something different than they do individually. So you need to think about the relationships between these objects, what they say about each other, right? Number six, between composure and seduction. Architecture involves movement it is a temporal art in that we can't experience all of it in one instant. Think about that. It requires time to move through it. Music is a temporal art. It uses a similar principles. Speed people up, slow them down, bring them into a crescendo, etc. This all comes from how we move through the space. Directing people is easy, but seducing them is hard. So what, what Zumthor is saying here is that we can very easily create a long linear hallway and everybody just knows where to go. The worst thing someone can say about a building is that we don't really know where to go and so we've had to put up all these ugly signs everywhere so that we can navigate. The building itself should tell us where we need to go. We should feel intrinsically that we know where the entrance is because it's framed in a certain way, because it's placed in a certain way. We should feel like we know where to go to get to the main volume, that main function that we have inside the building. We should know. The second part of that, directing people is easy, seducing people is more subtle, is talking about exactly what we see in this image here. So we have this beautiful gloss black timber strung vertically upwards to emphasize the verticality of the space. Then we have red stairs, also gloss, so that when they meet each other, we get this beautiful red glow happening just below our eye line. And then the nature of the curve of this staircase means that from the top of the stairs, we just get a sliver of what we're going to see when we get downstairs. And automatically, this creates a sense of mystery and intrigue for us. If we could see everything that we were going to see from the top, we already know what we're going to get. If instead we get a glimpse, all of a sudden, it's a far more interesting experience and we want to maneuver, we want to move around, we want to see something else. So when you're designing your form, you should think about that idea. It's an old idea. It's called denial and reward. So you reward people by showing them a bit. Then you take away a bit of it from them. And then you show them a little bit more so that they're interested. You take away some more again. Then you show them a bit more again. The very first example I can think of is the Pantheon in Rome. And so what happens in the portico, as a crowd of people step up to enter inside, we have these doors. And we go through the doors and we realize that it's a narrow hallway inside and it's much, much lower than expected. It's only a normal story height. And so now we have to go into single file in order to get into the space. So now we're thinking about ourselves as an individual. We're not a crowd anymore. Now this is me. I'm going to have this experience. And it's dark inside here. And then as we progress through to the next portal, let's call it that, an archway, we cross into the threshold and all of a sudden we're in a massive beautiful domed space, oculus from the ceiling, maybe five, six stories high, surrounded by lots of noise and people having the same atmospheric, wonderful experience together. And so there is that denial and reward sequence. We're giving things, we're taking it away. We're compressing people down, we're releasing them upwards. So we're never showing everything. We don't reveal our hand at all times, not until the final experience. 
So in your design brief where it's talking about generating a sequence from arrival to threshold to the interior of the space and the exterior, this is what it's asking you to think about. It's asking you to think about what are you doing to seduce people from one space to the next. This flows on to the next part of that as well, which is the tension between the interior and the exterior. Architecture takes a bit of the globe, takes a tiny box of it, and suddenly we have an interior and an exterior. There is a moment between when we are inside and outside. This moment is the threshold. This can be intentionally seamless, i.e. we want to bring the outside in. Very, very trendy in a lot of residential architecture. Everyone wants the outside garden to become part of their home environment. Or we can bring, sorry, or we can create a significant moment or a literal rite of passage. So we have to cross through the crucible into the other side of the architecture. So this is an example here from local architects where we can see the exterior there. We can see the internal volume that we're occupying, this pine room and this higher ceiling level here. But then by painting the threshold between the two and demarcating a specific zone, creating a bulkhead here so that it's a lower space, all of a sudden we can occupy this interstitial zone between the two spaces. And this is the threshold that we're creating there. So you're doing the same thing. As you create your path of seduction through your arrival, your threshold, your interior space, you're creating these moments along the way. Next is levels of intimacy. You might call it scale, but really it's about relative proportion to yourself. Things have a size, a mass, and gravity. Like how small a door can seem mundane, but an immense door can feel powerful. Thin walls and thick walls make us feel a certain way, as can tall spaces or short ones. Proximity affects this too. Far away from a big thing is different from being closer to a big thing. So this is another thing to think about for your design as well. So that point of arrival is the first glimpse you have of your structure that you're creating in the city. And you might be two streets away the first time you see it. It might be a little spike pointing out of the top behind a building. And you go, whoa, what is that? That's really interesting. I want to go through this laneway now to figure out what's going on there. That might be the first point for you. And so that's one level of intimacy, that thing that's in the distance that I want to go and investigate. The next level of intimacy is where you see it for the first time. This is a physical thing. And I go, OK, wow, now I can appreciate the form of this architecture. Then the next level of intimacy, one more time, is when you're at this length, when you're at touch length. All of a sudden, you can now see the cracks in the concrete. You can see the texture. You can see the joints of the material. You can see how the architrave works in the door. You can see the door handle itself. So we have these moments of shifting scale from the very first glimpse, the spike above the building, to the first time we see the form, to now we can see the actual materials up close. These are different elements of design. We need to think about how that will change. It shouldn't be a one-liner. It shouldn't be the first time we see it, we know everything about the building. It should change as we experience it. Last one, the light on things. We can plan architecture as a pure mass of shadow, and then afterwards put light in as though you're hollowing out the darkness. Very poetic, but all it's saying is that we need to think about light as a way of carving into the space. Or we can go about systematically lighting materials and surfaces, looking at how they reflect in the light. So you've got two options there. You can think about how the light can start to carve into the space, or if your materials are really critical to you, the objects are really critical to you, the thresholds, you might just want to light those key moments. You might want to create moments of intense shadow followed by moments of intense light. And so you get this sequence of light and shadow that we get to walk through and pass through. Okay, now Zumthor has two appendices, Appendix 1 and Appendix 2, which are as critical as the nine to understand. So architecture is surroundings. Atmospheres created in the previous steps can influence the experience of the user. Yes, we get that. It must be made clear, however, that architecture cannot exist in a vacuum. And so this is where a lot of the conversations with your tutors today in design come in. This idea that your building must be responding to the site. You must have a site first. You must research the site first and understand what it wants and what the people of the site wants so that you can respond to that rather than doing the same old architecture and putting it anywhere else in the world. It must be sympathetic to its site and location. 
So whether you're in an empty field or downtown in Tokyo, the architecture must exist within its context, in its place. All of the social, cultural, geographical, historical, and other elements play a role. Coherence is the second appendix. Vitruvius called it firmness, commodity, and delight. Well, architecture covers the delight portion of that. We still need the other two. So architecture, no matter how beautiful, must still stand up and must still meet the functional needs of its inhabitants. We don't have the freedoms of sculpture or painting. It still has to work. So we're not creating sculpture here. This isn't a free form art that all it has to do is be art. We're also subjugated to the fact that it must work. It must meet the needs of the program and the function. Okay, so that's atmospheres in architecture and hopefully that makes it a little bit clearer in terms of what we're looking for in design for atmosphere. Now I want to show you what atmospheric drawings look like. So we're doing two types of drawings this semester in methods, atmospheric drawings in Photoshop and post-digital collage drawings in Photoshop. Today we'll look at atmospheric drawings and then you'll use this technique for your folio for design. Next week we'll look at post-digital drawings and we'll use that technique for methods. They're two distinct techniques. So let's look at atmospheric drawings. This is RCR Architectes and this is what their studio looks like. I wanted to preface what their space looks like because it gives you an impression of why they design the way they do, because look where they work. The atmosphere is coming out the wazoo in this place. It's beautiful. The materials, the texture, the light, every part of it is superb. Now, all of the imagery is taken from my book, so I apologize that some of them are a bit wavy. I've tried my best to straighten them out where possible, but some of the images are a little blurred. So if you're wondering why a drawing is a bit curved or looking a little bit funny, it's purely because it scans from a book. Okay, here's the first drawing that I want you to have a look at. This is an atmospheric section. Uh, this is their water space tower. So we get an understanding of the texture of the space, the people, how they actually occupy the space. So we've got a naked person showering in here before they're allowed to go into the bathhouse. So this is the threshold. We are in the existing form. We must get naked get into the water, clean down, before we can then go have our bathing experience. Once we're in there, we have this beautiful, steamy, probably aromatic experience with the light coming in through these portal windows. There's texture, there's glow, there's sensuality to it. There's definitely atmosphere here. So this is an atmospheric section. Then the same building in plan. So we get that same sense again. This time we're looking at the water. We're looking at those steps. We're looking at how we descend down into this mass. We've got that glow again. Then we've got that carving of the light. So like Zumpthor was talking about, what they've done here is they've allowed the light to carve its way into the mass of the building. And then this is what the actual building looks like. So there's a direct correlation between the way in which they draw their spaces and how that outputs into architecture. There's a reason why they're taking so much time to put atmosphere into their drawings, because they want atmosphere to be in their buildings. There's that shower pod, so you'd be able to see the person showering nude in that threshold before they go into the main water space. And there it is in there. So you can see the texture, you can see the years and years of erosion in this place, see the carving of the light. Beautiful. Next project, La Lira Theatre. So this is their insertion, similar to what you guys might be doing in design, taking over laneway, putting your own architecture into it. And this is that section of that space. So we can see this floating theatre that we have up here and then the way in which they get light down into the space below. Lovely section. Site plan showing how we cross that water. We can see the shadow falling over the water there, how we progress and then the mass of the existing structures is all blacked out. Indoor pool. Even the way that they compose their perspectives is atmospheric more than it is post-digital, but you get a sense of what they're trying to achieve there. Site plan, once again. So they're using watercolour Photoshop for their trees. So rather than doing lines for their tree work, they're just kind of splodging in very, very carefully these ephemeral trees. You almost get a sense of the trees blowing in the wind just by the way that they're drawn there. 
Again, apologies for the waviness, but you can see their elevation, their section, and their plan there, side by side. Everything has atmosphere to it. Everything is related to one another. And then again, beautiful perspective of where we need to walk through this main corridor before we go into our changing rooms. Now this one I particularly love because this is uh, their detailed drawings, but because they're so invested in atmosphere and experience, They'll do a detail section through their exterior wall and side by side next to that, they'll do an atmospheric elevation to say, this is what that detail feels like. It's not a matter of just saying, these are the windows we've chosen. It's a matter of saying, this one feels like this, this one feels like this, and this one feels like this. So we can make decisions on architectural detail and construction based on what its end game is. House for an architect. Beautiful perspectives, lovely, lovely, lovely plants. Very, very ephemeral, evocative, dark, consistent with, you can see what the brief is. Can, you get it from the perspectives. There's a weightiness to it that they're looking for. Hence the darker plants than usual. Same perspective again. These are the sections. So we get a sense through the ground line, which is this blackness and then how we traverse through the landscape. We have this covering here and we continue on as we're going through. Elevation. Nice. Stables for people and horses. Beautiful project sunken into the landscape. Little model. Site. There's atmosphere even in the way that they compose their sheet and put their stuff together. Section, plan, section, elevation. And there it is again blown up. So if I zoom into this one, we can see how the light comes down through those grooves that were sitting in that grassed landscape and creates these individual atmospheric moments for people down below. Drawings, again, side by side with construction drawings, drawings ready to go for uh, DA, they've got their atmospheric drawings. They never separate themselves from the architecture end product from the atmosphere. They always want the experience to be part of that. Uh, re resolved plan, so this is the uh, finalised one now. So we see that plan going further. Those are those ribbons of rooms we saw before. Section has been improved again. And then we have these lovely, lovely perspectives of exactly what it's for. Stables for people and horses. Horses on this side, people on this side, engaging together in this experience of the landscape. Marquis for Le Col restaurant. I think this is an excellent exercise for you for design, cutting through a series of sections like this so that you can see what happens as we progress further through the design sequence. So if you've got a building which is on a path and we have this journey as we progress through the building, a drawing set like this really helps you to explain that idea and to show that sequence through the architecture. Nice. Beautiful. So this is the drawn section, and this is the outcome once it's built. So let's zoom in on that section. There it is there. So we see how the light comes in. We see how important that texture is, the weightiness, the connection to the earth. All of this is construction detail, but it's still atmospheric. Perspectives, more drawings. Row House. Who was I talking about Row House before with? Yes, there you are, Lucas. This is the one I was talking about for you. So there's a sequence of these plans here, which I think were particularly nice for what you were talking about in design today. So the way in which we layer that plan sequence and experience. So we're higher up in this level. And then what I love is when we get to the ground plane, which is this part here, all of a sudden the fireplace has fire in it. It's such a subtle thing. But we can see now, just through that one moment, that we're at this level here, and then as we descend down further into the basement, we have that pool. So through this one plan series, we get the idea of descending down through this sequence of spaces, very similar to the sections I showed before, but this time in plan. And there they are again. Beautiful. Okay, so what tools are they using? 
So let's go through it together here. Hard light. This is something that they're using over and over again in Photoshop. So this is where we see lines coming through to indicate that this is where the direction of the light is coming from, much like we would do if we were doing it in AutoCAD. Soft light. So this is slow radiating light. Doesn't have a light, uh, sorry, a line to it. Doesn't have an edge, but we can still see the light coming through. It's happening at the point of the window as well. There's a glow coming out of there. Hard shadow. So if we zoom into this point here, we can see there's an edge to this shadow right there. And that indicates the geometry there. Soft shadow. So we have this soft painted in shadow around the edges to really give a softness to that geometry and that experience. Ephemeral glow. So in order to emphasize the water rushing down into this pool, they have this glow coming off of there. That's the droplets. But then you notice off to the left and coming up through here is the steam. And that tells us what it feels like again. That's the temperature of the space. That's part of the atmosphere, which we get through that ephemeral glow that they've painted in. Same thing's happening over here at the threshold where we have to wash before we can come in. We've got steam, we've got particles going in through there as well. Material cues. So we can see all the way through here what the material is. And when we looked at the imagery before, we know that it was that old limestone that had been eroded over time and had a very tangible textural quality to it. And so we need that to be part of the drawing as well. And then we have texture overlay over the top of that. Because the material is one thing, but to layer a texture over the top is really important to get even more of that tactic, tactile haptic quality. And then we have people and objects. That gives us scale. It gives us experience. Up here, we sit and put our feet into the water. In here, we wash before we can come inside. And inside here, we have a beautiful ritualistic experience. Analogous color harmony. So if those of you know your color theory, we're borrowing from the same part of the spectrum. So we're using light colors. So colors that come from this zone here are all complementary to each other. We can use contrasting colors from the opposite side, or you can use color similar. You might even do a triptych. So maybe a aqua, a yellow, and a purple might belong together. But in this case, they've done analogous. So every color that we see inside here belongs to that portion of the wheel. So it's all responding to each other. It's all composed and in proportion to one another. Depth of field, we have the blackness of the section. So again, we can see where the structure is. Then we have one layer of drawing, which we can see here. We can see the line work for the drawing. We don't need dimensions for ours, but we would still be able to see the line work. Then we have the material in the background, and we have the blur over the top to give a sense of depth and layer of light and shadow. So there's depth to what we see inside there. OK. okay. So that's atmospheres. The important part is that you understand atmospheres is all about what's felt, right? So if you come back to that initial quote from Zumthor, it's all about creating space that moves us, space that had a lasting impact on us. You can go through the nine slides again, read through the book, and think about the ways in which they might impact your architecture. Use it as a tool and a method to design your own spaces this semester.